who coined the phrase, all that glitters is not gold. All that glitters is not gold. Uh, two and a half centuries later, during the California gold rush of the late 1840s, adventurous treasure hunters experienced this truth of this statement by Shakespeare. In their quest for this precious metal, gold rushers who travel across the country, they discover that not everything that sparkled was worth keeping. Uh, rock fissures and stream beds might be teeming with these gold flecks, yet devoid of anything of value. The counterfeit shimmer of iron pyrite, a common mineral, mineral quickly earned the nickname of fool's gold. And any decent prospector had to be able to differentiate the glittery look-alike from the genuine commodity. But like the rivers and mountains of the 19th century California, the current Christian landscape is littered with fool's gold. There is plenty that, that glitters, but is devoid of anything of spiritual worth, uh, worthiness. And of course, I, I say this in light of all the, the supposed miracles that transpire all the time within the deemed realm of Christianity and even the culture at large. Oh, this uh, brings us to our topic at hand today, understanding miracles biblically. As we begin to think of miracles through the, the lens, the scope of the Bible... Uh, let's first acknowledge some misattributions of a miracle. The misattributions of a miracle. Uh, most of the contemporary church and, again, contemporary culture trivialize the idea of miracles by labeling almost anything out of the ordinary as a miracle. Uh, think about it. Almost everyone, both inside and even outside the church, uses the word Miracle far more than one should. The term miracle is, is thrown out there almost at the same pace as our government prints money. And thus, as a result, is a word that has lost much of value. It is so flippantly used that people use it to describe a host of things that are clearly not miracles. Now, at the beginning of this, I want to have some fun. I think it's okay to have fun in church. That's, that's why we come, to have fun, praising the Lord. So let's think of this. Watching a tear-jerking movie, maybe one of those movies on Hallmarks, and it's, it's Christmas time. And, and little Timmy, who's the age of maybe Gus or Carson, somewhere in between. That's right, I'm calling out names today. and They're looking at me. They, they have this Christmas pageant coming up. And, and they want their dad to be there, but there's a problem. Dad's in the military, and he's overseas, and he's not expected back until a year later. And the movie progresses, and of course there, there's trials and hardships, as every good movie has. And then at the end, little Timmy gets up to sing, and lo and behold, who walks in? Dad in his military uniform. That's a Christmas, don't say it, but we do. We say that's a Christmas miracle. Or how about this? Going through McDonald's drive through with a vehicle filled with small children. Have you ever had that luxury? <laughs> right, and every kid wants something different. One wants pickles, one doesn't want pickles, one wants mustard, one doesn't want mustard, one wants chicken nuggets, one wants this, that, and the other. And normally, if your car is at least decently full, McDonald's almost never gets it right. They leave out this, that, or something. And the one time they get their order correct, it's a miracle! <laughs> we can think of wives. What about going a day in which your husband doesn't do something utterly idiotic? 
That was a miraculous day. <laughs> or think of this mom who, who loves Oreos. I, I bring up Oreos a lot. I bring that up in men's study. I, I don't know what it is. It's something about Oreos. But let's say we have a mother who loves Oreos. And, and normally the, the family will buy one package a week. And, and normally she goes to open up the cupboard and there's, they're all gone except for one Oreo. Well, this one time after a long, hard day, mom did this, mom did that. She, she, she wants a little treat at the end of the day. She wants her Oreos crushed in a glass filled with milk. And she opens up the cupboard and there's a pack of Oreos. And lo and behold, they're still there. It's a miracle. <laughs> we can have fun with that. But let's think about some more serious examples. What about someone desperately needing money? On the verge of bankruptcy, they're swimming in maybe $100,000, $200,000 of debt. They're going to lose everything. They're going to lose their house. And then out of nowhere, they receive a check from an attorney for a quarter million dollars. They inherited some money from a wealthy family member who just passed away. Is that a miracle? No. But what about the 70-year-old lady next door who has smoked non-filtered Lucky Stripes since age 10, smoking two or three packs a day, who develops lung cancer late in life? She goes through a year of radical chemo and radiation, and finally she hears the joyous news that all cancer patients desire to hear, your cancer is in remission. Is that a miracle? No. I've already said this, but it probably needs said again. Most of the contemporary church and contemporary culture trivialize the idea of miracles by labeling anything out of the ordinary as miraculous. So continuing to think of miracles through the lens of the Bible, because that's what we want to do. We want to think of miracles through this, through the Word of God. I want us next to consider some definitions of a miracle. I was watching a G3 podcast this week with Josh Bice and John MacArthur, and they're talking about several things, but one of the things Josh Bice asked him was this landscape of American Christianity and this latest research that came out where I think a third of evangelicals do not believe that Jesus was full deity and a host of other things that are clearly unorthodox. And, and Vice was asking, well, what's the problem? What's the result of this? And, and Mark MacArthur, I thought this was interesting because prior to him saying this, I would have disagreed. He, he said he didn't think it was an outright war or battle against these truths that we hold dear, that the churches hold dear and true for centuries. But rather, he said, is because of the church's failure to define things. And then he made the quote, everything needs definitions. Isn't it interesting? Because as you're going throughout your day and you're talking to maybe your spouse, your coworker, somebody can say something, use a word that you use, and yet means something entirely different. Right? So it's what do you mean when you use the word Church or Jesus, right? Because the Jehovah Witnesses, they say Jesus as well, but it's clearly a different Jesus than what we worship, who we worship. So we need a definition of the terms we use. So the question, what is a miracle? I want to warm you up with some shorter definitions and then maybe progress to a more lengthier definition. A miracle. The biblical concept of a miracle is that of an event which runs counter to the observed process of nature. It runs counter to the observed process of nature. Another short definition. A miracle. Those striking or unusual workings by God that are clearly supernatural. Now... The lengthier one, but it's, it's more robust, and this is from MacArthur himself. He says, A miracle is an observable phenomenon 
delivered powerfully by God directly through an authorized agent whose extraordinary character captures the immediate attention of the viewer. It points to something beyond the phenomenon and is a distinctive work whose source can be attributed to no one else but God. So boiled down to its <coughs> core meaning, a miracle can be described as God suspending natural laws and personally reaching into the life to rearrange people and their circumstances according to His will. Miracles must involve God's supernatural intervention. So let's go back to some of those misattributions of miracles. And let's go back to that cancer patient. Why is that not a miracle if they walk through chemo and radiation? Because that is what those natural processors are to do. Those are, those are poisons that are put into your body, the chemo is, that is to be placed where the cancer gobbles up and hopefully kills the cancer cells faster than your healthy cells. So that's not supernatural. That's what we would expect. Now, what is a miracle is that someone has cancer and they are prayed for and without going through treatment, they are healed. That goes against nature. That is a miracle. So we, we have definitions of a miracle. Now I want to further think through what a miracle is through the lens of a, the Bible and look at some examples of a miracle. So we're going to go to the Bible here. If you want to, you can start turning to 1 Kings. 1 Kings. And while you're turning there, and while I'm turning there, we can think of the miracles of the plagues in Egypt. 1 Kings chapter 17, by the way. Remember during the Exodus that God sent forth these plagues. These were miracles. God's divine interaction within of history. But let's look at some more maybe personal ones. 1 Kings chapter 17 starting in verse 8. And then the word of the Lord came to him, that's Elijah, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and stay there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please get me a little water in a jar that I may drink. Verse 11. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a piece of bread in your hand. But she said, As the Lord your God lives... I have no bread, only a handful of flour in a bowl and a little oil in the jar. And behold, I am gathering a few sticks that I may go in and prepare for me and my son that we may eat and die. Verse 13. Then Elijah said to her, do not fear. Go, do as you have said, but make me a little bread cake from the, it first and bring it out to me. And afterward, you may but make one for yourself and for your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bowl of flour shall not be exhausted, nor shall the jar of oil be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain on the face of the earth. So she went and did according to the word of Elijah. And she and he, he and her household ate for many days. The bowl of fire was not exhausted, nor did the jar of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke through Elijah. This is a miracle. There's no other explanation. How do you have a limited amount of flour, a limited amount of oil, and you use all that you have to make your last meal, you're planning on dying, and yet it's not. There's more for many days until... The famine is over. The drought is over. It's a miracle. Right? We, we understand that. We, we go to the stores and, and we fill up our shopping baskets and we uh, load up the groceries in our cars and we unload it at our house and put it up in the pantry. Man, that's a chore, isn't it? 
But we have to understand that as we're eating our, our Oreos and drinking our milk or whatever the case may be, we understand that, that, they, we, uh, that as we do so, those ingredients and those food staples, yes, Oreos is a staple, by the way. I, I think I should get a uh, kind of a kickback from uh, Nabisco. But anyway, that's beside the point. As we eat through those things and drink through our, our liquids, we understand, it goes away. This is a miracle. Turn to chapter 18. 1 Kings 18 might be on the same page. Verse 30. This is Elijah on the Mount of Carmel. <clears throat> Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he re Paired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. So with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two measures of seed. Then he arranged the wood and cut the ox in pieces and laid it on the wood. This happens after the prophets of Baal have had their turn of trying to have their God pour forth fire on their sacrifice. Remember the story, they're there and they're, they have their altar and they have their sacrifice and they're pleading out for fire. And then Elijah mocks them. Well, maybe he's on vacation. Maybe he's asleep. Why don't you cut yourselves and awaken him? And they do that and, and nothing happens. Because he's not real. Now it's Elijah's turn. And Elijah wanting to meet the burden of proof and demonstrate the fact that God is a living God. That this is a, a true miracle. So we, we've set up now. He has this altar. He has his wood. He has the slaughter sacrifice. And so he's getting ready to call to God to bring forth fire to consume the, the sacrifice. But wait, what does he do? He calls for the people, the worldly people, by the way, who would not want him to succeed. He called for them to go get water and dump it on the wood, dump it on the sacrifice. And he does that again. And he does it a third time. So, so this is drenched. It is soaking wet. And if you've ever tried to start a fire with a, a, a wet uh, brush pile or, or something of that nature. You know it doesn't work well. And he calls on God and God uh, comes down and burns it up in fire. It goes against nature. For a fire to consume something that is totally wet. 2 Kings chapter 6 verse 6. After this one, we'll look at some miracles from the New Testament. But this is an amazing one as well. The sons of the prophets said to Elisha, Behold now, this is in chapter 6, 2 Kings, The place before you where we are living is too limited for us. Please let us go to the Jordan and each of us take from there a beam and let us make a place there for ourselves where we may live. So he said, Go. Then one said, Please be willing to go with your servants. And he answered, I shall go. And so he went with them, and when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried out and said, Alas, my master, for it was borrowed. Then the man of God said, Where did it fall? And when he showed him the place, he cut off a stick and threw it in, in there and made the iron float. And he said, take it up for yourself. So he put out his hand and took it. That goes against the natural laws we have. Iron does not float. But I remember when I was young, it was, I was probably in between 5 and 10, we were at the lake house of... Uh, my grandparents at Shell Knob, and uh, my uncle Randy Carlson and, and Missy Carlson, some of you might remember them, they've since moved on, and some in Dallas, and so forth. But anyway, 
They're there, we're all having a good time, we're out on the boat, we're out swimming and everything. And my aunt's ring, which was gold, slips off to be seen no more. Why? Metal sinks in water. And so we see that here, but it is a miracle. He throws in a little stick and it floats. Well, let's jump to the New Testament. I just want us to consider things. We're not going to look at these necessarily in the Bible. We look through many of these as we walk through the book of Mark. Remember at the beginning of Mark, there's Peter's mother-in-law and she's so ill. She's laying down with fever. She can't get up and Jesus heals her and immediately she begins to wait on them. That's a miracle. Right? Normally when we're sick, there, there's a gradual progression of an upswing before we can ever do anything. Mark 1, and the cleansing of the leper. There's a leper, and Jesus touches him, and he's healed immediately. That's a miracle. In Mark chapter 2, the, the paralytic that's brought in by the mat by his four friends, they're, they're carrying him to Jesus, and Jesus heals him, and he immediately gets up and walks. Jesus stilling the sea. It's in this crazy storm that, that struck fear into the lives of these professional fishermen. And he call, calls it out to be calm, to be still. And immediately, no ripples, no, no uh, gradual uh, decrease of, of the waves, but immediately it's like glass. That's a miracle. Mark chapter 5. The woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years, she spent all that she had to be healed by these doctors. They could not do it, never, ever. And finally, she touches but just a thread of his cloak. Jesus' power goes out of him, and she's healed. Several more examples that I think we see. Our text today is maybe the last one I'll mention. Acts chapter 3. This lame man from his mother's womb. That it wasn't he had an accident and he had a, a, a bruised spine or something and needed time to heal. No, this is a man who was born lame. And Peter says in the name of Jesus, walk. And he walks. This is a miracle. So I ask, can you see the stark contrast between miracles reported in the Bible by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses than the many supposed miracles that happen today. Can you see the difference? I hope so. <clears throat> that doesn't mean miracles don't happen today. Miracles do happen today. But they have to be a miracle, not an alleged miracle. Hopefully at this point, we have begun to differentiate between the, the glitter and the gold. Between things that simply are not miracles and things that are Genuine miracles. Uh, really, it's coming to the understanding that there are toxins in the cowboy Kool-Aid that poison God's people and cause them to see things that are not. Thus far, we have considered some misattributions of miracles, some helpful definitions, some biblical examples. As we continue to think through of miracles through the lens of the Bible, it's critically important that we turn our attention to characteristics of a miracle. There have to be certain characteristics in order for it to be a true miracle. Now, before we look at characteristics of a true, genuine miracle, I want to ask a question. Why? Why is it important to contemplate and to understand characteristics of a miracle? Consider this. The Bible warns repeatedly to of ever, the ever-present danger of heretical false teachers. Now, this is due to the fact that they claim to represent God, yet they misrepresent His truth, so they do great harm. Jesus described these preachers in Matthew 7, 15 as ravenous wolves and warn that many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. Some will be exceedingly dangerous, showing great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Matthew 24, verse 24. 
So here Jesus is teaching that there's going to be things that look like miracles, but they're really not. The danger posed by such liars makes it imperative that there be a way to distinguish the, them from those who truly speak from God. The Apostle John, in his first epistle, recognized the need for discernment when he warns, Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out among you. That's 1 John 4, 1. So hopefully we can appreciate to, to some degree the need to know what the characteristics of a true miracle is. In our text today, the Holy Spirit selects one of the many wonders and signs mentioned in Acts 2.43 as an illustration. Look at Acts 2.43. This is what we looked at last week. That everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. So we might naturally question, well, like what? Well, chapter 3 gives us an example. Chapter 3 is this lame man, this lame beggar. And in this, we have four characteristics. That it's unexpected. It was done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was instantaneous, and it was complete. So let's look at our text of study today, finally, Acts chapter 3. That's all in the way of introduction. <laughs> Acts chapter 3. On the way to the temple, here we have two apostles. They encountered a, a certain man who had been born lame from his mother's womb. And... I don't bring this up much, but I do need to bring it up today. Uh, some of the, the syntax, the, the, the gra grammatical aspect of it, really. It's in the imperfect tense. And we go, well, what in the world is that? Is a verb translated was being carried along together with a phrase set down every day. It indicates that this is a daily routine to this location. It, it's ongoing. It, it's daily. So again, now here's the four aspects that we take note of in the, this historic narrative. First, it was unexpected. So this guy's begging for money. He needs assistance. He has no way to provide for himself. There's no U.S. government that tries to take care of everybody so that all will bow down to them. He needs some money. He's begging out. I, I need some help. And Peter and John come. Give him their attention. And he's thinking, all right. This is the day finally I get some extra money. But what did they give him? They don't give him anything of monetary value. They give him a healing. It's a miracle that happens. It was unexpected. Secondly, it was done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ meant by the virtue of Christ's character, His authority, and His power. Third, it was instantaneous. This miracle happened as all true, genuine miracles do. Suddenly, immediately, right? When, when Elijah threw that stick into the water to retrieve that iron head from that axe, it didn't take a day or two or a week to, to come up. No, it was right then he threw out a stick and the iron floated. All the other miracles that the Bible depicts happen in a moment, in an instant. Scripture knows nothing of progressive healings, of progressive miracles. Think about this in this story of this lame man who was born lame. The beggar didn't even need to be taught how to walk. Isn't that something? I, many times we'd overlook that. But you think about people who get injured at, at work or, or in the forces, in the military, uh, maybe athletes, and, and something happened and they have to learn how to walk again. That takes time. But here, a man, a grown man, never walked. Born lame can walk immediately with perfect balance. That's 
amazing. Compare that to one of the greatest hoaxes of charlatans today is the, the miracle, it's a false miracle, of leg lengthening. Have you seen that? Where these fake faith healers will go up to people on the streets and they'll say, oh look, one of your legs is, is longer than the other. And, and they're praying and both hands conveniently are placed on the person's ankles. And it's a slight of hand trick, really. But as they're doing it, it's a long prayer because it takes time to deceive the eyes. That's not a miracle. It's not a miracle. Why? It's not instantaneous. It's not be healed, hands are off, and it happens. It, it's slow. Father God, I'm drawing this prayer out so nobody can know, right? So you, we have to think through miracles in the lens of the Bible. They happen in an instant, in a moment, in a blink of an eye. Fourth, it was complete. Peter did not have to manhandle the beggar to get him up on his feet, stretch out his hand, but after that, the man walked, and it says he leaped up. As soon as he felt the strength surge through his feet and his ankles, he leaped, he stood upright, and he began to walk. His symptoms are completely gone. He didn't need crutches. He didn't need uh, an arm around another person. He walked on his own. The four characteristics of this miracle provide a checklist to screen all alleged miracles. A miracle that fits the true biblical pattern will stem from God's sovereign choice. It will be done to glorify Christ. It will be done in a moment and it will be complete. Further, think about the miracles that Jesus performed. Jesus' miracles were never limited. They were never doubted. They were performed in the public. They were abundant, and they too were instant. Anything that would claim the title of a miracle today should possess those qualities. You hear me when I say this. I'm not saying miracles don't happen today, because they do. But they have to be seen, and they have to meet the merit, the checklist of what the Bible says a miracle truly is. So continuing to think of miracles through the lens of the Bible, I want us to think of purposes of a miracle. Why, why do miracles happen? Hopefully we know what miracles are, at least to some degree. Why do they happen? Three reasons. One, to glorify God. Look at Acts chapter 3, verses 8 through 10, if you will. With a leap he stood up right and began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they were taking note of him as being one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg alms, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. It's done to, to give God the glory. Not Peter, not John, but it's, it's all about the Lord. Secondly, what's the purpose of a miracle? To establish a supernatural basis of revelation. The basis of God's inspired word. It, it, it's to testify of the messenger. Paul would say in 2 Corinthians 12, 12, the signs of the true apostle were performed among you with all perseverance by signs and wonders and miracles. These signs and wonders accompanied the apostles to demonstrate that they spoke authoritatively for the Lord God Almighty. And we see this same truth for Christ. John 5, 36. But the testimony which I have, this is Jesus speaking, by the way, which I have is greater than the testimony of John, John the Baptist, for the works which the Father has given me, the works mean miracles, wonders, signs, the works that the Father has given me has uh, to accomplish, the very works that I do, they testify about me that the Father has sent me. These signs and wonders that Jesus knew, they, uh, they assert, they validate that He indeed is the true Messiah. <clears throat> so miracles establish the messenger of God. Third, why do miracles happen? 
to meet human needs. Our Lord frequently is pictured as He moves throughout the Gospels. He's moved with compassion for the needy and the hurting people who came to Him. Matthew 14, 14. When Jesus went ashore, He saw a large crowd and He felt compassion for them and healed their sick. He healed them to relieve the suffering caused by such maladies as blindness, leprosy, hemorrhaging, and more. He didn't do it with a selfish purpose. He did it because He cared for the hurting. So miracles happen to glorify God, to establish the messenger, and because of to help heal people. Now before we draw our time to a close today, we need to carefully heed disclaimers of the miracle. And then just some quick disclaimers to put forth this morning. One, miracles do not automatically produce spirituality in those that witness them. To say this, sometimes I think it's the thought, if miracles will happen, if a true miracle would happen, then people would come to saving faith. They would believe in God. But what we see in the Bible, that's not always the case. The Israelites, set free from Egyptian slavery by miracles, mighty miracles, very quickly degenerated into idol worshipers. Even though the marvelous miracles of God were fresh in their minds. Think of Jesus after He fed the 5,000. He spoke and spoke of the miracle significance. Many of the disciples withdrew and would no longer walk with Him. A miracle just happened. And they're walking away. What about the parable of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke chapter 16? The rich man sentenced to hell. Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham. And in this parable, there's a chasm, and, and he can see into heaven. And in Luke 16, verse 27 through 31, the rich man said, I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers in order that, they may, uh, that he may warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, if they do not listen to Moses or the prophets, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. Just even if they see a miracle, it will not persuade them. So miracles do not automatically produce the spiritual fruit that we'd like to see. Secondly, there's counterfeit miracles. Counterfeit miracles. Satan and his demonic host can produce counterfeit miracles. They do so not only in false religions, but they also do it under the guise of Christianity. Christians need to heed history's warnings regardless of their own position on miracles done through human agents. Satan will do all that he can to mislead and deceive Christians along the dead end path of alleged miracles. This is 2 Corinthians 11 verses 13 and 15. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. There's counterfeit miracles. One of the best examples, I think, or maybe more famous in the Bible we have is the magicians of Pharaoh in Egypt, who at first mimicked and mocked and, and did everything that Moses did as a sign. But then finally Moses, of course, surpassed what they could do and they even feared. 
Third, miracles are not limited to biblical history or even Christianity. The fact that alleged miracles happen outside of the Christian faith should cause Christians to be wary of those who claim to do the miraculous. The one last disclaimer before we conclude. Throughout redemptive history, so we're thinking of approximately what? Six to 10,000 years? Between six to 10,000 years, there have only been three major periods where miracles were worked. The ministries of Moses and Joshua. The ministries of Elijah and Elisha. And the ministry of Christ and his apostles. And each time period is, is approximately 40 years. Those are the main periods. And even in those periods, they were not everyday occurrences. We end as we began. Heeding William Shakespeare's warning. Believe that if you can. Not all that glitters is gold. Not all that glitters is gold. Not everything that, that maybe appears to be a miracle is truly a miracle. Again, we're not saying miracles don't happen. We're saying we have to be careful. We have to understand what a biblical miracle is. And lastly, as we think about miracles, I think it would be a sad conclusion if we didn't consider the miracle of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is the greatest miracle. This is the, the central miracle in the New Testament. Think about the, new, the, the resurrection. Every book in the New Testament either proclaims or assumes the resurrection of Jesus Christ on the third day after his crucifixion. Miracles are great. They serve a purpose. Indeed, we're blessed to think if we experience one firsthand. But it'd be void. It would be worthless if we did not understand and believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Think of those thousands of people that saw Jesus feed them. Five little loaves and two fish. And they walked away unbelieving. That miracle did them no good of eternal consequence. Hopefully they came to believe in Christ later on, after His resurrection. But this again is just to say, we can see miracles, but unless we believe and put our faith in the glorious resurrection of Jesus Christ, who died in our place because of our sin nature, because we're deserving of God's wrath, because He's a holy God, if we do not believe in that, other miracles don't matter. The resurrection, the bodily resurrection of Christ from the dead, conquering sin, death, and the devil. That is central. That is fundamental. And that is what swings the destination of eternity for all of mankind. Let us pray. Father God, as we come before you now, We thank you for your word. It is in your word that we can measure truth. We know your word is truth. We are sanctified by your truth. John 17, 17. We as your people understand everything in this world is to be measured by your word. Even the very words I shared. And Lord, as we look at this topic of miracles, indeed we thank you that they happen, they happen. We give you all the glory. They testify of your people that you sent to speak on your behalf. And they're an example 
of your compassion for people who are suffering. But again, Lord, we take knowledge of the critical importance of believing upon the greatest miracle ever, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Lord, we would pray that if there is one in our midst here at church, in our lives outside of church, that, Lord, you would bring them to a place of repentance and faith. That you, you would use us as your people to be message bearer, bearers of a great Savior of great sinners. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.